uh, have all of you here on behalf of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy and OP Jindal Global University to be a part of this virtual open lecture. Um, we are very thankful and happy to have Dr. Tarun Arora who is joining us for our virtual open lecture series. Tarun Arora is not only a very close friend of mine, but he's an experienced uh, public policy practitioner and has been working in this field for a long time. He's currently employed uh, with the Janagra Center for Citizenship and Democracy as an associate manager in research and insights. I mean, it doesn't make sense for me to read whatever you can see on the screen. So I'll not go in further details, but I think what Tarun brings to the table today is his uh, amazing experience working with the Zanagraha Brown Citizenship Index Project, which he's been a part of for a while. And the results and like the kind of fieldwork that they have been uh, collecting from different cities across the country is fascinating to say the least. So without uh, taking any further time, I would invite Dr. Arora to please come and start with his presentation. So yeah, before that, sorry, uh, I think the way we would go with this is uh, Dr. Tarun, if it's fine, uh, if we could have a presentation of around 35 to 40 minutes. So I'll give you a small reminder after 35 minutes or so, so that we have, uh, you know, we have a round of discussion for around like 15 minutes, the last 15 minutes of the hour, if that's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah. Please feel yeah. go ahead. Yeah. If, if the poll is ready, I would like to have the poll right now. If you can just beat okay. that up. Yeah. yeah. Ajay ji, can you please uh, bring the poll first? Okay. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, so I would just request everyone to just uh, key their responses to this. A very short survey, four questions. But I think we can't choose. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, we can. That's yeah, 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 yeah. the radio button, right? Yeah. yeah. If everyone is done, then what we can do, I think if we can see the results of it right away. We are halfway through, 24. Oh, halfway, right. okay. Yeah. So this is a very important poll that I generally do when I do a methodology kind of a presentation, just to understand whether people are aware of the urban vocabulary or not, uh, especially polling parts and all that. Have they seen a voter list or not? Yeah. Yeah, I can share the results. Myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are the results visible? Yeah. Not to me. I can see only your screen, Amish. The home oh, screen. One second. I think Ajay can do this if he's if he's yeah. Let me try doing that again. Uh, Ajay ji, you can share this with me. Anyways, never mind. If that's okay. Uh, should I sh should I talk the should I share the results myself? Yeah, yeah. Just you can just talk to me. Oh. Okay, sure. Yeah, for the first question, have you voted in any elections? We have 45% who said yes and 55 who said no. Okay. Have you seen a voter list? 65% uh, of the people have seen a voter list while 35% have not. Okay. Uh, the third question on do you know what a polling part is? 25% uh, people have said yes and 75% <laughs> do not know okay. what a polling part is. Okay. And for the fourth question on, do you know what a polling part map is? 83% of the people do not know what a polling part yeah, map is. So this is this is exactly the reason I did this poll because a lot of people don't know what the polling part and the polling part map is. Right, so let's quickly jump to the presentation. And thank you so much, Namesh, for 
organizing this and uh, really really looking I was looking forward to this just let me know if the screen is visible yes and, it is okay sorry that's my uh, so let me yeah is it clear now yes oh great so thank you one and all for joining and uh, so let me just quickly uh, walk you through uh, my experience especially my uh, learning and understanding of how to sample and categorize households for research in urban India, which I've gathered uh, over the years while working on this project called Janagraha Brown Citizenship Index Project. So what I will do is I will quickly uh, tell you about what a JBCI project is. Then I'll quickly tell you what, what are the general or the common difficulties when somebody wants to take up research in urban area. Then I'll tell you what the methodological approach that we took while we conducted uh, the research, the survey research. First, the things that we wanted to uh, uh, ensure was that we wanted to ensure accurate representation of minority and Dalit Adivasi population in a city sample, right? And how did we do this? Second, how to create a sampling frame to sample households. Uh, the number three was a special case of Mumbai slum because Mumbai, anybody who's done research in Mumbai, they will, they will know how tough that city is to do a survey because of a very, very high proportion of slums there. Then how did we use those listing data to create city wastes, weights? I'll of course be uh, delving uh, in all these in a much more detail in my later slides. So JBCA, the JBCA project was conceived way back in 2012 as a collaboration between scholars and practitioners, right? This, this is a general uh, tussle, right? Uh, the scholars the think that practitioners don't have any idea what the theory is and the practitioners always <laughs> criticize the scholars that you only talk about theory, but you know what, you know, you have no idea what's the reality, right? So this is where I think it was a, one of a unique research collaboration with a practitioner organization, Janagra, and a scholar and academic organization, uh, Brown University came together, right? As equal partners, right? I believe you, this is one of the biggest urban governance projects in the country right now in terms of the sample size, in terms of the methodology, the scale of this project itself. It's one of the biggest projects. There are three key objectives that we are trying to achieve from this project. Number one, to construct an index of the practice of citizenship, okay? And how it is distributed across various socioeconomic categories. There are three different parameters uh, that we consider while uh, constructing a citizenship index. One is the knowledge of civic and political issues, participation in civic and political life. And the third is engagement with the government. The second very important index that we create through the data that we collect in each city is to construct the basic service delivery and infrastructure index. Okay, this tells you about what is the quality of water, electricity, sanitation, and roads in your own city. The third important objective is, of course, the relationship between the two. Our hypothesis is simple, that the cities which show higher level of the practice of citizenship, they're able to bargain better services from the state. Okay, so that way we create rankings of the cities in terms of the practice of citizenship and also the BSDII. Just to tell you the scale of study, we started way back in Bangalore in 2014. That was the first survey done. Then we moved to Mysore and Shivamoga in 2017 that we conducted two more, uh, covered two more cities within Karnataka. The last stage that we have finished our survey was a seven city huge phase. The collective sample size is 17,000. Currently right now, what we're doing is we are another, we're covering another seven cities, which is Delhi, Kolkata, Ajmer, Jalandhar, Lucknow, Bhopal and Bhubanesh. But we were supposed to finish the survey in 2020 itself because of now, because of pandemic, we have now, of course, stuck and we have, we have pushed this survey to later date. Now, let me just quickly tell you what are the difficulties. What are the general difficulties when you take up an urban research, okay? Number one, there's no clear consensus in what we call urban. Okay, just to give you an idea, there's an administrative definition and there's a census definition of what we say as urban, okay? I very, very clearly remember I'm meeting a person, I think it was principal secretary of UP, urban, and he said that, sir, I asked him very directly, so what do you think is urban for you? He said, urban for us is what we say is urban, <laughs> right? Very clearly. So what administrative definition tells us that any area by default is rural until it is notified and by rule of law, it's, it's, it's become urban, okay? Whereas the census definition has, of course, all the municipalities, corporation, cantonment boards, your new town, the, the townships, all those uh, areas apart from the census towns, like all those, we have three different parameters for census towns. One is, of course, what we call is, there should be at least minimum 5,000 inhabitants. The density should be 450 people. 
or at least 75% of the male population of that area should be engaged in non agricultural pursuits all these areas are also urban so what we can say is a uh, administrative definition is a subset of a census definition in terms of urban okay the second very important uh, issue uh, rather is there is a non standardization of political and administrative boundaries every city is divided into wards okay like for example in bangalore we have 198 wards and we have 198 councillors okay contesting from those wards so these are electoral boundaries okay sometimes if a city like ahmedabad or mumbai where most of the basic services are also de delivered by the same agency which is the municipal corporation of that area then there is absolutely no issue but what happens when the role of parastatals come in parastatals are actually you know state bodies for example in bangalore sanitation is a is a sanitation services or a water is provided by bwssb the electricity is provided by besco right so all these different parastatals are also coming into picture now the problem is that these parastatals have divided the cities in their own unique way okay then they're, they're not using the same standardized ward kind of a division of a city there's like for example bescom divide city into circles okay and the bwssb divided to different units so there is no overlap but there is no matching between the two units if somebody wants to do a study on governance like the way we are doing this is the first thing that we faced that there is no overlap between uh, the different uh, the information that we have from bwssb or any other agency or what the services provided by the municipal corporation a very very biggest hurdle or one of the biggest hurdles that you will see in urban is the lack of reliable base sampling frames a sampling frame is simple that from where you pick your respondents okay and the, in urban itself many people like conventionally what people do is they pick up voter list directly okay they sample some voter list and they just pick up few respondents from the voter list and they interview them okay in urban this is a huge huge issue because there's a lot of migration which is keeps happening the voter list are not updated regularly so what we do is what we see in voter list that they're riddled with errors our own survey janagra is has had done immense research research on quality of voter list and they found that in delhi itself just to just to give you some high uh, statistics we found that about 49% of the citizen that we spoke to in a particular voter list they were not on the list okay and then we then we wanted to match what are the names on the list with the people whether they are staying at the same address 21% were not there so this is the amount of errors that you see in voter lists okay if you use these voter lists directly right this is where you will land up in a problem right and they will not be able to get a representative sample of sort that you people claim from your sample and there's another issue that we have is a called systemic issue with the voter list management itself there's a lot of a booth level officers that we surveyed they're not paid properly so that's the reason they're not doing their job properly so booth level officers are actually the custodians or the managers of the voter list they are the people who are responsible for bringing in new people who have become eligible voter voters and also removing those who are not eligible anymore they are deceased or anything right so these are voter lists are not updated because they lack motivation there is not proper training right so all these reasons the voter list using voter list directly as a sampling frame is a big issue okay you cannot do that right and we took a very very conscious call from the beginning itself that we will not be doing this and the third very important issue is that pooling in the data from other sources again this is sort of overlaps with the issue that i just mentioned about because the units uh, at which the data is collected is different for example i want to get the information for sc and sts right uh, i want to classify say wards into sts and sts right uh, so or uh, wards into high muslim or non uh, non high muslims this information is only available at the city level SCST is available at the ward level. So how will you match that? So all these issues make the research in urban a very, very, I would say, a tedious process. Okay. Uh, so what we did, so our our findings very, very clearly suggested that you know there are a lot of research has already been done, which clearly suggested that Dalit and Adivasis and minorities they tend to be segregated. Okay. And in terms of basic service, you can see there's a very clear residential divide. and like ahmed and chandran they were also very clearly told that as india started to urbanize these minorities and dalit and others started getting pushed to the margins and when you want to do a representative sample of a city only basis voter list you will not see these people I mean, a lot of these people will get excluded automatically right so that's not a very reliable sampling frame that you want to pick up okay so what 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 to do in that case right this is where we and we had decided from the beginning itself that we going to use 
we are not going to use the vote list and we have to probably create our own sampling frame okay so we used a polling part unit okay a polling part unit as i said a lot of people in the uh, in the poll itself did not know what a polling part is the number of people who are there in a voter list okay those who vote in that area form a polling part simple okay that area right that's a polling part area so we wanted to use that as an anchor but we did not want to use those people on the voter list directly to sample our individuals that was a very very clear thing okay so now how to sample polling parts in a way that ensures adequate representation of these traditionally undercounted demographic categories okay answer is do not use voter list directly but create your own sampling frame okay but before that what we did we wanted so since we uh, in every city we knew that there are different polling parts city is divided into different polling parts and we have to randomly sample about say 60 polling parts in a city say lucknow okay how to ensure that those 60 polling parts that we have sampled will have a, a decent proportion of muslims or right or adequate proportion of muslims or dalit and adivasis which generally we tend to miss out in a simple random sample okay so that way what we did we chose a stratified a random sampling method so what we did we wanted to categorize all the polling parts in a city into a 2 by 2 matrix which is given there on your screen okay so as you can see screen the cell number 1 says a polling part which is high muslim high dalit the second cell says a polling part which is low muslim but high dalit adivasi dominated the third cell says a polling part which is low dalit adivasi dominated but it is a high muslim polling part in terms of population i'm talking about and the fourth one is the is the number of polling parts which are low dalit adivasi and low muslim right so that was it uh, okay right so when when we did that uh, can you some can you mute this please yeah let me check where is this coming from yeah. anyway yeah, yeah so when we used polling parts as our anchor to create a sampling frame and we wanted to categorize the number of polling parts in a city into these four unique categories what was the first issue that we faced right the first issue that we faced was that the population of dalit adivasi is only available at a ward level from census and not at the polling part level polling part is a smaller unit than a ward because there are multiple polling parts within the ward but we wanted this information at a polling part level so this is where the problem started okay now the second issue that was that the population by religious categories is only available at a city level from the census and not even at the ward level so this is another problem so how do you match these informations right to resolve this what we did we decided okay if the information is not available at the polling part level let's move to a next higher level category which is wards so what we did we did a geographical uh, classification uh, of wards using the information which was available okay at the ward level so what we did we classified all the awards uh first of all what we did is like for example in a city say bangalore there are 198 wards we computed the proportion of dalit adivasi population for each ward that this was available from census directly and then using a third quartile formula any ward with which has the proportion which is more than the third quartile value we classified as a highly dalit adivasi dominated ward okay and what in case of muslims what we did number one was since the information is not available even at the ward level we went to each and every city and met with the municipal commissioner met with the revenue officers and we also met with the local elected representatives especially corporators we took the maps the ward map the city ward map to them and asked them please can you please point to us which of the areas which of the wards do you think are muslim dominated they said they used to circle it for us okay like for example govindi in mumbai is a muslim dominated ward so that way we were able to get this local information from that or local knowledge from that that's why we were able to identify or determine these are the wards which we can say are muslim dominated wards in that city now because of covid what happened uh, we could not travel and we had to finish our sampling to start the survey as quickly as possible and this local information uh, option was not available then what we did then we figured out a different strategy to classify wards as high muslim or low muslim wards we took the shape files okay the qgis shape files which are the ward files for each city seven cities that we did for example delhi kolkata jalandhar ajmer then what we did 
We literally counted each and every Muslim institution and each and every ward. Okay, we counted those. Okay, and we uh, created an Excel sheet, a spreadsheet, and we counted and put the number right next to each ward. Then, then what we did, uh, once the information was available, uh, once the information was available, then what we did again, we used the same third quartile rule and we were able to identify which wards are Muslim dominated and which wards are not. So I can actually tell you how this information actually worked because when I went recently went to Kolkata, the ones that we actually identified as high, high Muslim wards using just this information or the exercise that we did, it was spot on. We were able to reach the high Muslim areas in Kolkata, right? So that's what we did just to get the information at the ward level. Now, as I said in the beginning, our anchor was a polling part, not the ward. Okay. We need to get this information and bring it down to the polling part level. And how did we do that? Method was simple. Okay. All the wards, okay. All the polling parts within that particular ward were classified as the same category as it was for the ward. For example, this is the example of Lucknow. We have 110 wards. There are three high Muslim, high Dalit wards, 23 low Muslim and high Dalit wards, as you can see on the grid on the left-hand side, which is grid number one. So all the, all the wards, uh, all the polling parts within those three wards will also be considered as high Muslim and high Dalit. So there were 16 polling parts within those three wards will also be classified as high Muslim and high Dalit. So this is something we did. Okay, so how do you match this information? First of all, this you have the information at the ward level. How do you match it to the polling part level? Generally, you do it using the vote list. With the first page of the vote list of a municipal election, I'm telling you, a municipal election vote list gives you this information because the municipal election happened at the ward level and each vote list represents one polling part, as I told you in the beginning itself. So that way, you are, it's a one-to-one -one match. You can do that, right? So that way, we were able to get this grid, a very important grid, that we wanted at the polling part level, we were able to get, uh, we were able to stratify each uh, each in the number, total number of polling parts into unique four categories that we wanted. Okay, so there were, four, four, there were total 544 polling parts. Now we have the information at the polling part level, right? So once you have that, what do you do? The method is simple. You simply do, you compute the proportion of each cell, okay, uh, out of the total. So if 16 is 3% of 544, 119 is 22% of uh, 544, 129 is of 24% of 544, and 280 is 51% of 544. That way you were able to get the, to the unique set proportion of each and every cell. And if you had to sample 60 polling parts in Lucknow, this is how you were able to use the proportion to size approach, and you were able to get the number of polling parts from each category. Right, so that way we were able to include the Muslim people, the Ladit Adivasi people. That generally a simple random sample would tend to miss out. Okay, this 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 stratified sample approach that we used. Of course, we had to collect so much of information just to get this particular final grid. But this actually helped us now include those polling parts which we believed would have actually we would have missed out on if we would have done a simple random sampling of polling parts. Right now. Once we have right those polling parts, what we did, we need to, as I said, we need to, well, once we have the polling part, I, as I told you in the beginning that we're not going to use the vote list directly. So what do we do? The second page of the vote list gives you a very good map, okay, of a polling part, which is created by a booth level officer. As you can see down here, there's a picture of a polling part map, which is created by a booth level officer for Bangalore. It tells you very clearly what are the number, what are the streets, what are the name of the streets, what are the main roads, everything, right? That anybody can see, but well, this is the area, the number of voters, the, the total number of voters live in of this vote list. Now we use this map and what we did, we listed actually a person, a field investigator walked down this road of this polling part map and listed each and every building in that polling part area. When they listed and we listed only the households, we did not list the commercial buildings. This is how a listed map looked like. Can you see it below? This is a clear comparison of how a listed map looks like after it has been listed. Also what we did, when we listed the buildings, when we counted the buildings and we plotted them on the map, we added another layer and we said, let's also classify these buildings as slum, shacks, lower middle class, middle class, 
I'm an upper middle class and upper class. Okay, we had some very very clear criteria. By the person just the look of the building, he's able to identify and give them a housing type tag. So we were able to do two things with this listing process. First of all, we were able to create a very robust sampling frame from where we can pick our households to a survey. Number two, we were able to create a very very genuine proxy for a class variable, which trust me in social science research is a very very difficult variable to create. Many people have used assets. Many people have used try to do. Income used income, they have miserably failed. They are not able to capture the class variable very clearly. But this way, we were able to get the class variable a very decent proxy of that. Okay, so but this was the case for Bangalore. Okay, now what we did when we did our last seven phase, right at the beginning, when we looked at the polling part maps. Okay, I mean to our shock, the polling part maps were of not not of usable quality at all. Okay, just look at the polling part maps that we saw. Okay, this is one of the Chennai maps. The first one is, of course, the Kerala map. One of the in one of the cities uh, that we picked in Kerala was Kochi. So this is from Kochi. This map would have been good. This is a very clear example of a bad scan. Okay, the second one doesn't have any information. Third one, I don't know what they made of it. So absolutely no information, and we could, we don't have any information on the outer boundaries. So we could not use them to list to list the households. Then another process. Then again we had to innovate. And what was the innovation? What we did. All those sixty polling parts that we sampled, okay. Again, the voter list gives you a very, very good information that is called the polling station, where the people go and vote. Okay, the polling booth. It gives you the polling booth address. So what we did, let's create a proxy map, okay, which of a polling polling part which we call Nazariya Naksha in Hindi, which we generally has around about thousand to twelve hundred people, okay. And about 350 households. So we needed to create that a proxy so that it is able to capture the similar set of people that we wanted from that polling part. So what we did, we collected the names and locations of all the polling stations that we sampled, okay, of polling parts. We translated them into English. We geotagged them, okay. We were able to find the lat longs of each and every polling station, and we uploaded them on the QGIS software. And you can see this is an example of Kochi. This is how they were spread. Those 60 polling parts. The polling stations, the locations were spread like this. So this is a clear example of how uh, a stratified, a random sample would look like. Because if there were clusters, this means that you have done some. There's some, there's some issue with your sampling. Since it is spread properly, you can see that it has been properly sampled, right? So now what we did, we wanted to cover some area around those polling stations. Okay. So what did we do? And we, as I said, there are about twelve, twelve hundred to eight hundred to twelve hundred individuals around three and around three hundred households in the polling part, a typical polling part. So we wanted to ensure the proxy map had to ensure the same number of people, okay, or an on an on an average in a city. So what we did, we created, we drew two circles of seventy five meter, a hundred meter, and a one twenty five meter, and we piloted these three types of maps or these three sizes of maps in each city. believe you me this was this took us one month extra and a lot of resources but we did that finally after doing this we found out it was a 100 meter radius which was sufficiently covering the required number of households that we needed so that's what it gives us a good proxy of a polling part map right and we standardized this 100 meter map across all the cities okay so once we done that this is how a map looked like a circle but the problem with just a circle was that the circle was actually you know cutting across a lot of apartments uh, a lot of uh, buildings and structures so we wanted a clear outer boundary so what we did we superimposed a polygon on top of it okay a polygon a simple rule was very simple that the the polling station would remain in the center and any closest road which is probably next to the other outer boundary of the circle we will include that and this is how we will get a final a polling final area map or a polling part map and when we did the listing guys This is how the listed map looked like. Okay, right. We classified, as I mentioned, we classified them as informal shack settlements, slum housing, low middle class, upper middle class, and upper class. And we could get a summary right at the top. The number of P ones, type one houses, type two houses are there, and type three houses are there. And this is one of the most robust sampling frame that we could create to sample our households or the individuals from that. And this was because since it was a mini census of sorts of that sample of that area. So that way we were able to include each and every slum, each and every shack, 
which a simple random sample of polling part would have missed. So that way we were able to do that. Right. Uh, now the second very very huge issue that we faced was was Mumbai. Very clearly, right? Mumbai is is a really really tough city to survey, and uh, uh, when we sampled the polling parts and in Mumbai, right? This is how they look like. Okay, when we created those maps, and this is how they look like because more than fifty percent, around sixty percent of the city is in slums. Okay, probably every second household is a slum in Mumbai. Slum dominated areas, as you can see the picture above, right? This is a very, very. Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, the person, trust me, one field investigator actually went inside and he was he was not able to find a way out. The listing of households in in a slum area like this, which is so dense and congested was almost impossible. But if you don't list the households, the number of households, we were not able to get the sampling frame. So again, we were try, we were, we had to figure out a way to get a sampling frame from where we can pick our households. Then, because the inside streets were not visible at all, right? The only thing that was, as you can see in the images visible is the asbestos sheets and roofs. This is where we got the idea. Let's use these roofs to create a sampling frame, okay? Right. So what we did, a sampling frame was just created by counting the number of roofs on the satellite image. This is the satellite image, right? The satellite image was divided into three or four equal parts depending on the size of the map. And once the map were divided into the required number of parts, team randomly geotagged the roofs, okay, okay, in each part of the map in a stratified manner, right? Four parts and number of roofs. Then again, we took a proportion. Then proportion to size approach, we again then only tag the number of roofs in each area randomly. Okay. When the houses were geotagged, lats and longs of those uh, tagged roofs were shared with the field investigators. And they and they, when they put those lats and longs on the Google map, they were able to reach the location okay, of that house. And if they end up right in the middle of the street, they will be told, please do a simple toss of coin and see which one you want to take up. Right. So that way we were able to create a sample frame in, in case of Mumbai as well. Right, which was otherwise it's a very very hard city to, to survey, and there were such twelve such locations, and of course we were, we had Dharavi as well there, and that way we were able to uh, able to capture. We will do. We were able to create a sampling frame and able to interview a few people from there as well. Yeah. So what we did also that uh, in in case of in in our cities, what we did, we actually introduced an element of a booster survey, a booster component. Okay. The shacks, the HT ones, which are like a completely probably the poorest of the poor, which which are the self-built housing, right? Which we, people create their houses using plastic sheets or asbestos sheets. These are the people you generally don't see, right? They're probably lurking somewhere behind, right? So we wanted to make sure that these people are also there in our sample. So we are, we introduce about a 10% booster sample in each of the cities so that we can have those people as well in our sample. But since we have introduced a booster. We have to collect that uh, uh, booster percentage by using weights. So the listing data again helped us get an understanding of how the city is spread is. And by you, by city weights, I mean, we use simple raking weights by dividing the population we got from the listing figures and the sample figures by creating simple raking weights. And we were able to adjust for that as well, right? So that way we were able to create uh, a representative picture, go back to the representative picture of the city. Right. So a lot of innovations were done. A lot of efforts were done just to make sure that we, we can claim that our data is a representative of the city. Right. And so and we were also able to overcome all those issues of sampling frames that we that, which I mentioned before, all those issues of overlapping and mapping or the unit, the issue with the units. And uh, of course, it took us a lot of time. Uh, this process itself took us about uh, about two years to create. OK. And finally, when we were able to implement that as well in the seven cities, and then when the results came out, and we were we were thoroughly, thoroughly uh, overjoyed by just looking at how good the data is, and we can claim that this is probably the best uh, the urban governance data that we have created so far, right? So with this, I'll just end my presentation, and over to you, Namesh. I hope uh, people enjoy the presentation. Thank you, <laughs> and I hope I I'm, I was on time. Perfect, you were right on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for this great presentation, Tarun. I think it kind of re-emphasizes the importance of looking at a research project from scratch every time you're starting a new one. And more than anything, I think we all have been fascinated with the 
sampling strategy that you guys have proposed for this project. So, I mean, through this GBCI project, I'm more than anything, we were, we've been able to get a comprehensive understanding of the challenges that any researcher who plans to study urban issues would face in the Indian context. And I think it was kind of very elaborately done. Uh, before I move ahead, uh, I would, and I just realized that we have our Dean of the Jindal School of Government and Policy, Professor R. Sudarshan with us. So uh, Professor Sudarshan, if it is okay, we'd be more than happy if you could just express your comments on the presentation. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, Professor Sudarshan, you're on mute. Oh, yeah. What's it? Karthik, unmute. Hello. Yeah, Karthik, can you please unmute Professor Sudarshan? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is this is the first time this has happened. <laughs> yes. This is history. really unfortunate. No one's dead. <laughs> um, so anyway, thank you. And that was a, a, a fascinating uh, presentation. And and it just goes to show that you know it takes a lot of um, innovation and good ideas and imagination to come up with something that is statistically robust and at the same time. Um, you know, you get results uh, surmounting these challenges. You know, we were, you know, I was involved um, in the first um, human development survey that was done by NCAER with uh, UNDP support, and I was in the UNDP then. And Abu Salah Sharif was the demographer in NCAER, uh, and we had the statisticians from the NCAER, and so. The challenge there was, of course, that we wanted for the first time uh, a sample survey that would capture different population groups, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, some are in small numbers, some are larger. And, and then, but we also, also there's the challenge of uh, economizing the cost. Yes, so you have to keep the sample size to as small as possible because every household you add costs money. Um, and so we, we spent a lot of time on that and we ended up with a sample of 39,000 households for India in that survey. Uh, now, of course, people were, why so much? I mean, now if you didn't want this differentiation with population subgroups like you were looking for, um, you could use a much smaller sample that would be quite representative and statistically acceptable. But this, this it, it's not, so much is that you need to, but how, I mean, the imaginative part of what you presented is fascinating. I mean, you know, just to say, okay, now that we have satellite maps, we've got Google, you know, how do we use this? And that's fantastic. I think uh, that's a wonderful uh, piece of, um, you know, and I hope you've written it up somewhere, this, uh, uh, how you went about this, which would be very valuable. And so I just hope that it triggers the imaginative possibilities um, in statistics in our students who don't just think it's some, you know, formulaic subject, uh, but it's something that lends itself to intelligent uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind, kind comments and kind words. So the thing is that, of course, I'm writing this paper. I have written up this paper with my colleague at Janagra, and it's going to be coming in a book very soon. And I'll be sharing this with you all. And of course, I'm going to really, really help a lot of urban scholars, at least when they want to sample and, uh, you know, for their own research. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Professor Sudarshan. Uh, we have Professor Subhashish Ray who have a question. Uh, uh, I guess, Karthik, can you unmute him? I guess we'd have to do this every time. Karthik, please unmute. Yeah, Karthik, maybe you can Subhashish unmute Shreya. as of now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. We've got some nuisance makers, so I think it's good that yes. IT controls this yeah. and mutes whoever needs to be unmuted. <laughs> uh, 
Karthik, are you there? We are the mercy of God. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have done it. He is still on mute. Karthik is calling Karthik. Okay, I have a, I have a question uh, for uh, Tarun. Uh, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. So just some, uh, you know, standard kind of questions because, I mean, I mean, you know, political science. There have been so many people writing papers on urban governance and so on. I mean, you know about the work that people like Tariq Thachil. I'm sure you're aware of, uh, yeah, the work that they do. I'm not aware that they are doing such sophisticated, uh, you know. Uh, kind of sampling works. So I guess I'm just. Have you benchmarked your findings with theirs? Like, is there a, like a, you know, some huge gaps? I mean, differences in the sort of things that you're finding in terms of uh, participation and uh, you know the the outcomes that you talked about. I don't okay. even if you've progressed to that stage. But no, if yeah, you could exactly. share, yeah, yeah. So if you could just share that, and also in terms of yeah, descriptive statistics, also like. You know this. Uh, the usual, you know, the the usual measures of class, asset ownership, and so on. Like how, like how much is the sort of what are you getting? What sort of uh, you know numbers are you getting? How does that match up uh, with those uh, the the traditional measures? Yeah. It'll be great if you can. I'm sure yeah. most of our students would like to know that. No, no, absolutely. I think it's a great, great point that you raised, Sabashish. So first of all, the first thing that I'm trying to do right now is. I mean, I'm going to you know uh, compare my demographic numbers that we have captured in our sample with another, like the national surveys that are being done, like NSSO and NFHS. Right? That's something which will give you give you what's happening in those cities and towns, and what they are getting and what we have actually got. And that's of course as we move on, and we'll definitely compare our studies, uh, I mean, our findings with those of. Uh, the academic people that will be doing some similar research that with the names that you mentioned, but that's going to happen absolutely, and going to be a paper just on that how our sample strategy is able to capture the voice, the true voice of the cities by including all those people, which generally tend to get neglected if you have a simple random sample. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Lucius. Uh, I have a question from Professor Krishnan who asks if at any point in the future, if these data sets would be publicly available or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, Krishanu. I think that's something which, so we have signed uh, signed up a contract with our, uh, uh, with our donor. It's going to be an open data very soon. Absolutely. That's something which goes without, without saying that we will be releasing this data on our JBCI LinkedIn page. Please follow the page, of course. So this is a time that I can actually <laughs> use <Advertise>. this page, <laughs> advertise our page as well, where I am going to generally share the findings of this. And what we are trying to do is uh, we want to clean the data as quickly as possible and start sharing this, especially the Bangalore Shimoga Mysore, which are pretty old now, but we should be able to share and still people can make sense of it and can use this. Yeah. And the last phase, which we have just covered, Absolutely, within a year, I believe, I think we'll be able to put this on open, open public domain. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. We have Professor Sunaira has a question. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Namesh. Thanks, Kartik, for unmuting me. And uh, <laughs> Tarun, very, very, as the Dean said, you know, it was very fascinating. I actually uh, have a suggestion because personally, I've never, you know, this was the real first time I've heard about Q uh, GIS and QGIS a lot. But this is the first time I'm actually seeing a sampling properly done and being, yeah. you know, presented. So this was quite fascinating and um, absolutely going back to my surveys, though it was in rural area, but we never knew these techniques then. These were not that common, you know, at least yeah. in India, they weren't that common. So definitely, but it would be a good idea if in your manual, what you're writing in the book chapter, you can also write up on how you can make them representative at different levels. So at the moment, it's, you know, you're having urban areas, you went on to different categorization, but for the children, like for PhD candidates and all, uh, though uh, we tend to, you know, kind of put a lot of emphasis on rural areas when we talk about development indicators, you know, yeah. but like, uh, for example, my work is on health and I know how, how challenging the situation is in urban as well as in rural areas. So it's nice to have counterparts. So different representation level. And as you said that you would be uh, trying to compare with NSSO and NFHS, like NFHS stops at the district level as of now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So even going further down is a huge benefit. And that is what we usually do. 
because with PhD surveys, we, we are not coming at, at any such level. So in your manual, if you can have, you know, uh, maybe a section where you can say that how Kitty can make it representative. Absolutely. No, absolutely. That's a great point, Sanana, that you just made. Okay. And, and making the levels of representation and when right at the start, how can see, I mean, the layers of representation is, of course, a function of your sample size, right? And you have to probably increase your sample size. And then, of course, you can go to, down to layers. And of course, as uh, Professor Sudarshan also said, it's a, it's a function of cost, right? <laughs> and uh, that's where you need to increase your sample size to make it more representative at the lowest layer possible, right? So, I mean, of course, uh, a note in a manual where I can say which layer it is, till, till what layer it is representative would be really, really helpful. Yes, absolutely. And also, for the student, it's important to know what's the cost, as in, what is the drawback of not doing that big? Like they all know, okay, the the size of you know if the sample size goes up, you know the power will improve. Yeah. They all know everything theoretically, but it's nice to see maybe live examples yeah. in the manual. Yeah, so it'll be helpful. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks. I think, in fact, what, what I'm actually thinking is I'm going to do a, probably a workshop on this because one presentation doesn't do justice to this. And, and, and very soon I'm going to have a, a workshop on this for at least three, four days just to explain how to do go about this, like a live city, right? Just start from scratch, right? Looking at the polling parts from where you draw the polling parts. Even people don't even know where to get the vote lists, right? And there's a different vote list for a municipal level and a different vote list for a, a state and uh, uh, for parliamentary elections level, right? There are two different lists created. Right. And one is at the state level and one is, of course, at the central level. So a lot of things and there are errors which are more in the central probably or at the municipal level. So all these information in urban, which is which is right there and people don't know how to use it would be would be, I think, would be a great thing if we can do that at three, four day workshop sometime later. <laughs> yes. So now, yeah. it just, to, just to sorry, Navish just wanted yeah. to push pull, to put in one thing building on uh, Sunaina's point. Uh, Tarun, can you clarify? I thought you said that. The polling booth level, you know, that kind of sampling approach is reasonably okay for rural areas. I thought that was the sense I got, or did I get? I mean, can you yeah, absolutely. It? Yeah, so I think that's the thing. The same polling booth approach you can use in uh, rural areas as well. But the thing is, the good point about rural areas, the voter lists are good. <laughs> so no, that's what I'm saying. So you're saying the existing approaches is okay for rural it's okay. areas. It's okay for rural. Areas. It's the yes. urban areas it's where the it urban gets a messy. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very cool. Cool. yeah. Perfect. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think while people are thinking about this, I was, I think even Professor Tushanu raised that point when he just sent me a text for students, especially with the master's level who are studying courses such as sampling methods and research methods. This kind of puts in as a very real life example on how we use the concepts that we study at for, a, for an actual research project. And at the same time, trying to understand the innovations that you would have to go through to ensure that you're able to collect the data properly and the way you want it to. So I think that way it is useful. And as I was saying before as well, I hope we, we are able to take this further and see if students from our, like from our department are able to get associated with this project and others that are employed by you and Janagra so that they are able to learn further and be able to really understand how like research in urban areas works, if not even other places. Yeah, I see Professor Vivek also has raised his hand. Please, sir, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Sarun, uh, for, for a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. I have a very quick question. Did you have the opportunity to calculate the design effect? And if so, what was the number? No, I was not able to, Vivek. Yeah, so we didn't know that. And I don't have a number ready for that. So, yeah, probably we'll do it sometime later. But... Uh, but when we when we had a research design and when we created, I think we were pretty sure that the way we have gone about it, it is a pretty robust design. But we could not quantify or operationalize the number for you right now. Yeah, so I'm sorry okay. for that. Right? No worries. Thanks. All right. Perfect. I Yes, no, sure. Vish, can I ask another yeah, question? Yeah, please, please go <laughs> ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm really curious. I mean, I, I guess this question is about, I mean, obviously we're all curious to see what the findings are and so on. But yes, yes, yes. if you could tell a little bit, Tarun, about your motivation for doing something as big as this, like a little bit more about, you know, how did you get involved with Brown? I mean, what was your dissatisfaction? I mean, I mean, obviously sampling in, uh, you know, South East, you know, South Asian cities is hard and so on, right? So what was the dissatisfaction that made you go into for something as big as this, like yeah. uh, if you could just shed some light on that. Yeah. Okay. So Janagraha, I think, as you know, is a practitioner organization and we want to improve the quality of life of citizens in cities and towns across India. That's something which is a mission that Janagraha drives. Right. And uh, so, and we want to do this, of course, through two things and through channels. One is, of course, by, uh, you know, increasing the citizen participation and by, of course, making 
uh, you know, a proper transformational change in the basic services and infrastructure in cities. So, but when we wanted to intervene and wanted to make an intervention in other cities, we wanted to get some baseline information. What's the level of citizen participation and what's the baseline information on the basic services and infrastructure. And we knew that the problem, the, the already existing data sets, especially on urban, those who use the conventional sampling methods and all those are conventional sampling frames, we know that we cannot be trusted, but they're not so reliable. So that's the reason we actually forwarded into creating this particular methodology so that we at least get the right baseline information where we can actually roll out our programs some at later stage. So that was a very important motivation Sabashi, that we started with. And we've already been into Mumbai, we already into cities that we've already surveyed so that we know that this is a level of citizen participation there. And we can now of course have a targeted intervention there at this level that we need to improve probably benchmark this to this level and it has to be improved. So that way we can customize our programs so that we can push the citizen participation levels and the basic services levels through advocacy efforts and all that. Yeah. Yeah, so can you give some examples of some findings that you thought were, you know, unreliable or anything that was like, okay, this cannot be true or this is too, some anything, some example. <laughs> like uh, without without naming names or whatever, if you don't want to, but something. Yeah, something I know. That... So, so we did, uh, <laughs> so we have three cities from Gujarat itself, right? That itself should tell you that like, why should we, <laughs> so like we okay. have Nagar and Vadodara and the findings that our traditional surveys tell you that everything yeah. is Anki Dori in those cities, that it's actually not. And I can tell you right now in our, survey that we did in three cities, especially in Ahmedabad, right? Yeah. There's a like very, very clear class in class segregation in terms of basic services, in terms of citizen participation. And <laughs> so I just okay. want to pause it there, <laughs> but there is a clear, clear uh, uh, difference. Okay, good. That helps. So that helps to know. I mean, I think for our <laughs> yeah. students also, it helps to know yeah. how big projects get started, right? Whereas uh, sort of, yeah. And uh, the Ahmedabad report is ready. We'll be releasing it soon. And of course it'll be made public and everybody can see that report very soon. Yeah. Oh, so, and so you found clear differences in terms of class, uh, sort of uh, access in terms of class. Clear and significant sources. <laughs> okay, compared to other, using other measures and so yeah. on, other kinds of service strategies. Yeah. Oh, that's, you should say that then you were, why are you hesitant to say that? Is no, it because I'm, you have it online? No, 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 the reports are not released right now. Yeah, that's the reason I'm just hesitating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Vivek, do you have another question? Or I don't know if it was from the previous one. So. No, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Namesh, I... you should push our students to ask questions. I think you need to push them a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I mean, they have I they have very so for questions. all so for all the courses that I mean, I'm this is for the students, for all the courses that you have uh, like studied by now, I think this is the best possible chance that you might be getting to talk to a real life practitioner as well. Yeah, absolutely. Really see how, what kind of things that you'll be facing after once your graduation. So if you have any questions, yeah, this might be the best opportunity. That and ask as basic questions as possible well. because yeah. that's how I started as well. So don't worry. <laughs> um, yes, Sudhan. Yeah, I want to add, Namish, yeah, in every class that I take, I've been always saying that, you know, how do we reach that sample size? That's another question and not in the scope of the course. So here, here's a chance, you know, to ask him directly, how do yeah. we calculate that and get at that number? <laughs> because all that I mean, I'm talking about central limit theorem and law of large numbers, like when N is large, you know, and how yeah. large. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the man you should catch and <laughs> ask questions, yeah. Yeah. I think even if not for the presentation, I'm assuming Tarun would be more than happy to interact with you guys. And whenever you have, if you have any concerns or even if you are interested to know what kind of opportunities exist after your master's in yeah. this kind of domain. So yes, please feel free to, I'm, when I'm, I'm speaking this in behalf of Tarun, so I hope Tarun like you <laughs> reciprocate that thought. So yeah. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's something which we, so the research is now becoming very, very important in, in the practitioner space as well, right? And and we do a very, very action-oriented research thing, right? And we are sampling methodologies. All these things are very, very important because our entire intervention are dependent on that, the findings that we do, right? So, so that way we take our research very, very seriously. And even though it takes a lot of time to decide on, okay, this is the sample that we have picked up. This is, I mean, of course, based on whatever the confidence level and intervals numbers that we decide. But this is the approach that we use and I mean, no matter how much time we spend or how much resources is gonna, gonna spend on this, right? But if we get the sample right, then only we'll get the representative picture, otherwise we will not. So that we take these things very, very seriously. And 
trust me when you when you graduate from your i think from the, your course the practical application of these things i mean you will struggle and that's exactly because this is how our pedagogy is designed and that right because very because you get very little experience of going on the field and doing all these things and especially you people are graduating in a pandemic year you will the opportunities are even more less right so how will you do this how will you get these information like for example in the pandemic year when we were not able to get the muslim information and how did we innovate right every time you could be have to think out of the box and innovate but making sure that your research design is not compromised your systematic research design is not compromised that's what we did right so yeah i think it would be a great great thing if you can associate with janagra and and we can of course take it further than amish yes absolutely i think the primary takeaway after the end of this presentation has to be for that never <laughs> ignore your sampling strategy in your research design <laughs> even when you're thinking of your dissertation and spend a great amount of time like just brainstorming through it namesh especially in urban i'll ask one more uh, yes. i just one more question for uh, tarun before we let him go yes. tarun yes, say a little bit more about this i mean how much of this was done during the pandemic and before and if you can say something about surveys and pandemics in general something conceptual in terms of how to no, approach absolutely. it if you absolutely. can say something so yeah. like even even i can just tell you a very generic give you a generic answer to that like even in our jbci when we before we start surveying the individuals right it's like a lot of cities that i in fact haven't visited in my life like for example we picked up ajmer in rajasthan or jalandhar in, uh, in in punjab i've never visited those cities in my life so mm-hmm. when you start directly going there and start doing a survey a youth survey right that would make sense so what we always do is we always go there do two fgds with the local respondents slum dwellers every city just to get the baseline information of what's happening in terms of service delivery okay we always this information helps in two ways of course getting the initial pulse of the city and number two inform our questionnaire how do we inform our questionnaire there's a lot of local terms which are used and these these people can only use in their own uh, local uh, context like for example in amdavad an mla is called amdar and mp is called khasdar nobody knows what mla mp means when you start doing you asking them directly so you have to incorporate these terms in your survey questionnaire as well right so when we do this fct there is a lot of information that we get first hand we help and, and support our questionnaire so uh, even in the pandemic right a lot of people so i mean a lot of information that we wanted we actually started looking out for like there is a second data which is available and all that but but we never never compromise that okay we will not compromise on our field to field face to face survey that we did to the main large survey that we do okay so this is going to happen we we said okay let's delay it by near no problem but we need to do the survey on the ground and get the first hand information also very important point subhash is that we delayed this because when the second wave is going on when the pandemic is going on your your responses are going to be value loaded right because all the responses you're going to give are will be in the context of the pandemic right? right so we said always better to delay this and get a situation which is normal then only roll out the survey right so whenever there's a there's a, a black swan moment like this has happened or something which happens mm-hmm. always yeah. delay your survey don't go don't rush into doing a survey because your the responses that you will get from the ground will be in the context of that particular backs for moment so please delay it please men- get some no- situation normal situation then only proceed with your survey otherwise don't yeah that's great thank you thank you for sharing that wonderful yeah i think i might just build up uh, a question to what subhas is had just asked like uh, especially considering uh, how the pandemic is still continuing do you think we you might have to bring some see, like some uh, modifications in your strategy or you might have to even revise the way you would uh, just go and collect your data in the near future yeah so that's i mean i right now we are just waiting and watching to be mm-hmm. honest right we we thought okay one year delay is not a big and our donors were flexible mm-hmm. right they said okay one year delay is absolutely fine so and we said okay let's wait and let's see if the my only concern is whether the respondents will open up mm-hmm. to answering a survey which is as big as jbc survey which is about 150 questions around 45 minutes okay that we, so my only thing is that so that's what we need to pilot and mm-hmm. when at the moment there is normalcy i want to pilot just to see how respondents are opening up to a survey questionnaire in a mm-hmm. pandemic area in a pandemic stage yeah. so that would be another finding and of course i definitely will share with everyone and let's see especially the upper class and upper middle class households mm-hmm. apartments and bungalows mm-hmm. because they generally they generally resist surveys like this and if some especially in the pandemic stage i don't know how they will open up but let's see that's a good big question mark for me and i will of course give you the results so much you can so much you can contribute methodologically to the methodological literature to the yeah. conceptual literature wow this is big very good congratulations <laughs> thank you subhash perfect
Yeah, I think uh, with this, uh, yeah, again, I again would like to thank you, Tarun, for being a part of this session and like talking about your again absolutely interesting presentation. We hope to see you again sometime soon in the near future, virtually and maybe even physically if that happens. And other than that, I want to thank everyone for being a part of this session and hope you all had something interesting to take away and learn from this. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank the you. opportunity. Really thank looking you. forward thank to meeting you. you all in person sometime. Sure, <laughs> sometime sure. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All thank right. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.